Well, please turn in your copy of God's Holy Word to the Gospel according to Luke and chapter 4. Luke 4, we're going to consider, as we continue on in our series in Luke, we're going to carry on in verse 14 and uh, consider up to verse 22, 21, 22, I suppose we'll read up to. Um, And just for a bit of context, we have seen thus far in the Gospel that our Lord Jesus Christ has been tested He has been proven to be our Savior, tested and tempted by the devil. Before that, he was anointed by God and proclaimed to be his beloved Son, the Holy Ghost, having anointed him to be the Christ. And so with all of that in place now, Luke draws out the very beginnings of his ministry to us, his people. And Jesus Christ himself begins to preach the gospel of the kingdom. A gospel that you will find is centered entirely upon himself. With that, for some context, please turn your attention now to the reading of God's holy word, Luke 4, beginning in verse 14. This is the very inspired and holy, infallible word of God. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, And he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this, is not this Joseph's son? Amen. God bless the reading of his holy word. Let's pray for the preaching of the word. O our Lord and our God, what a marvelous, what a glorious thing it is to see the Son of God himself preach the word of God. And now, Lord, what a, what a humbling thing it is that the Lord Jesus Christ has called his ministers to preach the word And Lord, none of his ministers, least of all myself, are worthy to pick up the book and preach the word as Jesus preached. And so, Lord, we ask that the same spirit that rested on Jesus that day would rest on the preacher who preaches now. That you would overshadow his weaknesses, his deficiencies, his own sinfulness, Lord, that he may minister a word of peace to the people of God. Lord, would your spirit not only rest on the preacher, but also rest on every ear that hears, that this word would drill deep into their mind, and not only their mind, but even into their very heart and soul. And to that end, Lord, we pray that you would let my speech and my preaching be not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Amen. Well, people of God, as we come now into the public ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, our text shows the clarity that Jesus preached concerning the purpose of his first coming, which is to liberate us from the misery and curse of the fall and to in himself become salvation 
for us. What a remarkable thing it is to have in the Savior's own words his purpose expressed and preached. And to have that as the very first public action recorded in the gospel. It is meant for us to not miss the fact that he is that promised son of righteousness, promised to arise to bring healing in his wings, to free us of our misery and release us from our bondage and our debt to our sin, to reconcile us to God. That is his own purpose, and you have it in his very own words so that you will never, ever miss it. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to do something that is alluded to in our text, and we will look at it. I want to blow, as it were, the jubilee trumpet and preach the glorious gospel message, friends, that Jesus came to deliver us from our misery, that you would yourself recognize your own debt to God and the misery that comes out of it, that you would see in this text that you are the poor, You are the brokenhearted, the captive, the blind, and the bruised. Utterly incapable of delivering yourself from the shackles of sin, the world, and the devil. And that you would see Jesus as deliverance. And your deliverance, particularly. To cast yourself solely on him to be delivered of all these things. And to praise God for such a Savior sent by God. And that you would live your life then in view of such grace that has been poured out to you in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That is our theme this morning. And I wish to preach it by the three heads on your outline. First, we discover in this text that Jesus is sent to public worship. Second, Jesus is sent to the miserable. And finally, Jesus is sent to deliver them. Praise God. So first, Jesus is sent to public worship. Now, for some context that we've already considered, I want to circle back, though, so we have it at the forefront of our mind. These are the first public actions of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Luke has been careful to establish his credentials thus far to show that Jesus is the promised and prophesied Messiah of old. And if you've been with us these last 23 messages, you will have seen that in great detail. But to summarize, he was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Ghost. Second, he was anointed by the Holy Ghost at his baptism. And third, he was taken by the Holy Ghost to be tempted by Satan in the wilderness. We have just seen that. There are other areas where the Lord establishes his credentials in his genealogy. But those three areas are really those three prime areas where Jesus is proven worthy to be Messiah. And so Luke is very careful. You know, this is a careful account that he wrote to Theophilus. You remember that. He was very careful to show the qualifications of our Lord before he begins his ministry. In the same way... In the church, we don't have a man become a minister before he is proven qualified. And Luke does the same thing. I also want to, because I have been trying to find a good time to do it, and and this time seems as good as any, I want you to note and remember the agent behind each of those events of Christ's uh, uh, proving and Christ's uh, declaration to be the Christ. The agent is the Holy Spirit. You'll notice that in every activity. He is conceived by the Holy Spirit, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. He is anointed by the Holy Spirit. He's taken by the Holy Spirit to be tempted uh, by Satan. And it is Luke, as a writer in the New Testament, who seems to most draw out the operation of the Holy Spirit in the life of our Lord. But you also notice that he also has a care for that in the Acts of the Apostle, too. In fact, more properly, perhaps called the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Right, uh, Luke has a very much a concern for the Holy Spirit's activity. And as Jesus begins his public ministry, he does the same thing. Verse 14, Jesus returns in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. In verse 18, 
Jesus cites Isaiah 61, which we'll get to, that says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I want to take a moment here to remind us it is the Holy Spirit himself who made him Christ, the Anointed One, that comes from the anointing of the Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who also brings to bear on his human nature the gifts of divinity to empower him for the work of the ministry as God-man. Uh, now, I don't have time to get into that. That's some deep Christology that distinguishes the Reformed from the Lutherans. We can't handle it now, maybe during sermon discussion. But for us, I want you to see that you, the people of God, are utterly dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit for all things. And you need to plead for his presence and power in your life to live as a Christian. You cannot live the Christian life without his power and presence. It's impossible. Impossible, friends. If the Holy Spirit anointed Jesus to be the Christ, the anointed one, it's the same Spirit that made you a Christian when he regenerated your hearts, friends. The same Spirit. The same Spirit will also sanctify you. You are called in Romans 8 to mortify, to put to death by the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit that brings newness of life. You need to become dependent on the Holy Ghost, friends. Not in the way charismatics are, supposedly. But we must become dependent on the power of the Spirit. What did Paul ask in the book of Galatians? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? What's the implication? It is the Spirit's power and activity that is necessary. It is not your own flesh that will sanctify you. Praise God. That said, in verses 14 and 15, we see that Jesus taught and preached in the synagogues of Galilee. And I want you to remember their response. There went out a fame of him through all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues being glorified by all. There was a tremendous response to the preaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to come to the, um, I believe, the response of his own people in Nazareth next time around. But there was a, a tremendous response to his ministry in the region. And here in our text, he makes a visit to the town of Nazareth where he grew up. Boys and girls, he is Jesus of Nazareth after all, isn't he? Jesus of Nazareth. This is his hometown. It's where he grew up and the people were familiar with him. They ask in verse 22, is this not Joseph's son? They knew that by the flesh he was the son of Joseph. As I said, I'll deal with their reaction next time around. I don't want to focus on it today. But in this heading, with a little bit of that context behind us, I want you to see that the Lord was sent to preach deliverance in the public worship of God. And he preached that message on the Sabbath day in the public worship of God. In verse 16, there's so much in this verse. We could have probably preached an entire sermon on it. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. There are two points I want to make from that simple phrase. The first is, it was our Savior's custom to be present in public worship on the Sabbath it was his custom to be present in the public worship of God. In other words, he does not neglect and never neglected the public worship of God, friends. Our Savior had a commitment to it, and he was always there on the Lord's day, the Sabbath day. Our perfectly righteous Savior kept the Sabbath as the day of holy worship. That has to mean something, friends. It was never a day of private worship. It was a day of public worship, and his custom was to be found in the public assembly of his people. And how much more so that must be our driving principle, too, to be committed to public worship on the Sabbath. Make our text apply to you, beloved. What a wonderful thing it would be if God would say truly of all of us that it was your custom to be in the church on the Sabbath day. What a glorious testimony that would be, that when we go to glory, that God could truly say, it was your custom to be in my courts on my day. 
It's a wonderful testimony, friends. So that was the first point I want to make from that simple phrase. It is our custom, uh, our Savior's custom to be present in public worship on the Sabbath. <laughs> and the second is this, and it sounds very similar because it is. It is our Savior's custom to be present in public worship on the Sabbath day. It's a similar point, but it differs in application. That Christ is now here with us in the public worship of God, praise God. And he visits us by his Holy Spirit, that same Spirit that anointed him. In Hebrews 2.12, he says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Will I sing praise unto thee? He comes here, friends, in public worship to minister grace to us. Why else do we call the elements of our worship service the means of grace? He is here, as we will see in this text that he reads, He has come to minister grace, to deliver us from sin. He comes here to cause us to glorify God. He comes in the public worship of God. So friends, be found in the public worship of God to receive his mercies. You have to believe it, that he is here. You have to believe it by faith. And how fitting that he comes on that day to deliver a message of deliverance on the Sabbath day. Boys and girls, do you not remember that the Sabbath day was the day of freedom, wasn't it? It was the day of liberation from bondage and slavery. You remember that when the Ten Commandments were repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 5, God gave us another reason, not just creation. He gave us another reason to remember the Sabbath day. What was it? And remember that thou wast a slave in the land of Egypt. And that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Friends, the thing about the Sabbath day is that the Spirit wants you to see this as a day where he proclaims deliverance. It's a day of liberty. A day where you will come to hear your deliverance from bondage. For us, a day of deliverance from our bondage to sin and the world. How fitting it is, a message that Jesus preaches on the Sabbath day. And friends, he is preaching that message now, isn't he? As he reads this text to us out of his word. And on that day, that Sabbath day, the Lord was in a synagogue. And I wanted to treat this briefly. He was not at the temple. There's only one temple in the land, but there were many synagogues throughout the the cities of the people of God. And it is the case that most public worship occurred in them. It was much rarer to be at the temple. Uh, Most made a pilgrimage to the temple on the feast days. But most Sabbath day assemblies were in the synagogue. Now in redemptive history, that is quite fitting because God was preparing his people for the destruction of the temple. After Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for sin, the temple's days were over, and the people would continue to worship in synagogues. Uh, You'll see that the order of worship in a synagogue was almost identical to ours. That's really a wonderful thing. The scripture was read. The scripture was preached. The psalms were sung. Prayers were offered. And The apostolic church's worship services were patterned after the synagogue. You remember James 2 verse 2, that he uses the word synagogue to describe the Christian assembly. And so we praise God that the service that our Lord Jesus Christ visited that day is very similar to what you and I are doing today. So that little bit of an aside there. What we see here is that the Spirit of the Lord took Jesus to the public worship of God. And the same Spirit of the Lord brings you Jesus Christ right now in the public worship of God. That you might hear the same message of deliverance and release from sin. That was the substance of our first heading is to really glory in public worship and to be here on the Sabbath day. And as we continue along, let's continue in in the, the, the narrative here. And see that on that day, Jesus was invited to read the scripture and preach it. He was handed the scroll of Isaiah. Likely he requested it, though the text doesn't say one way or another. And if you know 
the book of Isaiah, you know it was written 700 years before Jesus came in the flesh. 700 years, a prophecy of the Messiah. And so, boys and girls, it wasn't a book. The word translated here is scroll. And he takes the scroll to the 61st chapter, and he reads from it. And what he reads and preaches out of it is astonishing and is the substance of our second heading, that Jesus is sent to the miserable. Verse 17, And there was delivered unto him the book or scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And I'll hold there. You know, our Lord was deliberate in choosing this message to preach as the first public record of his ministry, friends. And if you think about it, it is also a message deliberately chosen by the Lord for us today in McKinney, isn't it? He chose this message for you. I did not. This is just our sequential text, after all. He chose to speak to you today through it, and you need to believe that whenever you come to public worship, that the Lord has prepared a word for you, and you need to come in anticipation that this is a word for you. And so listen carefully to what he has chosen to speak to you this day. Verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This text... Isaiah 61 explains to you, if you need an explanation, of why the Spirit had anointed him to be the Christ. It is for this purpose, to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, to recover sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. If you ever need to ask yourself, why was Jesus anointed to be the Christ? Turn to Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, and you will have your answer, friends. And these words are so gracious, and I have to ask if they were gracious to you. Were these gracious words, or could you take them or leave them? Well, the people that day marveled at the graciousness of these words, for these are the words of the gospel itself. The word gospel, boys and girls, means good news or good tidings. Good news or good tidings. And sometimes maybe we use the word gospel so much, it even has become part of our common culture's vernacular, the gospel truth, that we just don't remember what the word means. It means good news, the best news, the very best good tidings from God as the angels proclaimed at the nativity of our Lord. You must remember and remind yourself often, friends, that the gospel is good tidings from God. You're prone to forget it. I am too. You sin, you despair, you suffer, and you forget that there is a gospel that preaches good news to you. Your faith itself is centered on good news. Your faith is centered on good news, beloved. Good news from heaven. Good news found in the person of Jesus Christ and his gracious works for you, if you believe on him. And the beautiful Reformation saying that these benefits are received by faith alone. What a glorious gospel we have, and yet we are quick to forget. So I want you to consider who that gospel is meant for. It is intended for a very specific group of people. The poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, the blind, and the bruised. Not the rich, not the stout, not the masters, not the sighted, and not the whole. That is who our Lord Jesus came for. After all, he said what? They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. And these are the sick, the poor, brokenhearted, captives, blind, and bruised. 
Those are the kinds of souls that Jesus came for. And no other. No other, friends. He didn't come for anybody else. Some of us are ashamed to find ourselves in this bucket. Some of us hate being called that. But those are the only kinds of souls that Jesus Christ has come for. Those are the only kind that will be saved, people of God. They that are whole have no need for the physician, but they that are sick. And I want you to consider these five characteristics with me this morning. First, Isaiah 61 says that Jesus would come to preach the gospel to the poor. Yes, those who are materially poor, praise God, often see that they need Christ more than any other. But these are not simply the poor materially. These are especially the poor spiritually. In verse 27, we'll see that next time. Jesus uses Naaman as an illustration after all. Brethren, but boys and girls, you remember Naaman was a powerful man, wasn't he? He was a rich and powerful man. But he was afflicted with the leprosy and his spirit was crushed. And on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus preached his first blessing. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You who are poor in spirit are those who know you are not righteous. And your soul is afflicted by that. You know that you are without hope in yourself. You know you cannot pretend to be righteous. You know you are ensnared by sin. You have a hard time holding up your head. You are like that publican at the temple. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Not daring to lift your head up. While besides you stands the self-righteous who is boasting about his good works to God and his religious performance. No, you are broken by your own sin, and your conscience is afflicted by that. You see that you stand before a holy and righteous God, and you see that you owe a debt to him that you can never, ever repay. You know that your ledger before God, your sin debt, has made your ledger blood red. That's true poverty, friends. That's true poverty. Knowing you owe a debt to God that you can never, ever, ever pay back. A ledger full of blood. And as you consider your good works and you try to atone for your sinfulness, you realize at some point that even my best works are as filthy rags polluted by my own selfishness and my own sinfulness, my own lack of glory for God. Praise God then that Jesus was sent to preach good tidings to you who are poor in spirit. And he says to you now, he says to you now, beloved, that he himself can pay your sin debt and that his blood can make your ledger black, friends. Be filled by Christ by faith. If you are in your poverty, know that you can have the riches of Christ and know that he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. That's your God, friends. That's who came to preach the gospel that day. Second, and I know I can't treat each of these in great detail, so I want to give you the sense of them. Second, Isaiah 61 says Jesus would come to heal the brokenhearted. A very similar, similar category of people. You are brokenhearted, especially when you see the perfection of God's law. And oh, how your heart sinks before it. The law, which is that majestic testimony to the holiness of God and that he is a righteous God and judge. And to really understand that law is to be brokenhearted because you know that you will never, ever attain to his holiness by it. Others, others pretend they're good and virtuous, but you cannot deceive yourself. And your heart breaks when you see that you have come far short of the glory of God. And God has blessed you. God has blessed you. And this is the thing that you have to understand. If you are a Christian, God has blessed you in being brokenhearted over sin. Because Jesus has come for such as you. We just sang it, beloved, 
in the 51st Psalm. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Friends, if you are brokenhearted over your sin, you need to praise the Lord for it. Praise the Lord for it today. You may never have praised the Lord that you are brokenhearted over sin. So let me tell you to praise God for that is the blessing of God. No man is broken over his sin unless God's spirit breaks the heart. After all, boys and girls, what's the opposite of a broken and tender heart? It's a hard heart, isn't it? It's a hard heart. A heart that hears the word of God and like the Pharaoh of old, rebels against it. There's no blessing in a hard heart. There is only cursing for a hard heart. A hard heart is the sign of the reprobate. A broken heart is the sign of the believer. Far better, friends. Far better is it to hear the law of God and be convicted and be broken by it than to recognize you fall far short of it and don't care or are resentful that thus saith the Lord. Embrace a tender heart, friends. Believers, if your heart is hardening to the word of God, that is a dangerous place to be, a very dangerous place. If any of you have hardened your heart to God's righteous law, may the Spirit today prick your heart so that you would mourn over your breaking of it. Only then can you ever be healed, beloved. Only then. By turning to Jesus Christ, who has said he has come for such as you. You know, our sin, we are really broken when we see that our sin is more disgusting than Naaman's leprosy. When we see that leprosy is a far better condition to be in than the estate of sin. That's when we're really brokenhearted. So if we will be brokenhearted, if we will repent of our sin and ask the Lord to forgive it, it is astonishing, to my mind at least, that a holy God has sent his Son to heal sinners broken over sin. And the healing, as we consider leprosy, we'll consider that name and next time, the healing is not only forgiveness, praise God, but a restoring of life where sin brought death. That's the glory of the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He brings life and health back to our countenance. The healing of Naaman, we'll see next time, is a vital illustration of when Jesus heals the soul. For when death once reigned through sin, life is restored to us by the great physician. Seek to be broken by the holiness of God so that in repentance, the glory of God would shine upon you and grant to you newness of life, friends. That's where the blessing is. A broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. But that is the very sacrifice he looks for. Third, Isaiah 61 says Jesus would come to preach deliverance to the captives. Now all of us by nature, friends, are captives. We are held by those three great foes of the soul, sin, the world, and the devil. We think, <laughs> this is the deceitfulness of sin. We think and we say, no man is my master. But to the contrary, friend, Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the slave of sin. John eight thirty four. You know, our, our natural bent is to say of our sin, I can give it up any time I want. I am its master. It serves me. Well, friend, just try to give it up, and we'll see who has control of who. You are no master of your sin unless you are in Christ and the Spirit of God is in you. Sin has enslaved you as the Pharaoh of old was enslaved by it, and how the people of God were enslaved by the Pharaoh in turn. But the Bible also calls the unconverted man the captive of the devil. 2 Timothy 2.26, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Jesus said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. Whatever the devil says to do, 
those who are outside of Christ will do. They believe they have agency, but the devil is their puppet master. You know, it's so interesting. We thought, talked about this the other, uh, other day when we considered the devil. Last time around, how men will make their compacts, so-called, with the devil, right? To sell their soul to the devil and to have the devil serve them in that way. But how silly it is of us. How silly it is of us, friends, to think the devil who refuses to serve God is going to serve us. It's a ridiculous thing on the face of it. Instead, what the devil says, you will do if you are outside of Christ. You're of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father, ye will do. But we're also held captive by the world's philosophies and traditions. Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you, that is, take you captive through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Converts, especially, find this to be the hardest of captivities to be freed from. The philosophies of the world. The traditions of the world. Because from a very early age, at least in our society, if you do not grow up in a Christian home, you are essentially brainwashed and taken captive by the philosophies of this world. And not only... Notice here, uh, the apostle uses philosophies plural. The world can't even agree on a philosophy. And so you find philosophies like these in the world today. Stoicism, Epicureanism, Hedonism, Materialism, Empiricism, Rationalism, Marxism, Modernism, Postmodernism, Atheism, and even Moralism. The great perverter of the grace of God. The list goes on and on. And each of these make you captive to their systems, friends. Boys and girls, you need to beware the philosophies of this world. You really do. What the Bible is saying is they actually take you captive. They blind you. There's no freedom in them. There's only a continual striving to reach their ideals. Look at how the world today is devouring itself with its own philosophical systems. Nobody is Marxist enough. Nobody is socialist enough. Nobody is whateverism enough. You are held captive. There is no rest, and there is certainly no salvation in the philosophies of this world. Because they are not built on the truth of God's word, and so they make you a captive. The Bible says, beware lest any man spoil you through them. So we praise God that Christ has come to liberate us from the bondage of the world and the effect it has on our mind. So you see here the captivity that we see in this text are to those three great foes, sin, the world, and the devil. And praise God that the Son of God is sufficient to deliver you from him all. Fourth, the blind. Isaiah 61 says Jesus would come to recover sight to the blind. And yes, Jesus miraculously restored the eyesight uh, of many physically. But that was just a sign for a greater eyesight that he has given to his people. In Acts 26, via Paul, Christ explains what the restoring of our sight really looks like in verse 18. To open their eyes, see that? And to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. The apostle himself had his own eyes opened, didn't he? And how the message entrusted to him by Jesus Christ must have resonated. You think of it, once he was so utterly blind, wasn't he, to the glory of Jesus and the evil of his own sin. He said, I am a Pharisee of Pharisee. My righteousness, according to the law, exceeded them all. But when he met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, in a turn of events, Jesus blinded him physically so that he could see. 
so that his eyes would be open to see the glory of the Lord for the very first time. Small wonder that the Holy Ghost used Paul to pen this prayer for us, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of his glory of his inheritance in the saints. Ephesians 1 verse 18. It was not, beloved, physical eyesight that he came to restore. In fact, it is better for you to be blind physically like Paul, but to see Jesus. Jesus came to open the eyes of your understanding, because you and I are born blind. That is why the gospel makes no sense to most who hear it, because Jesus has to open your eyes. For by the eyes of your understanding only can you perceive true spiritual reality. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Matthew 6, verse 23. When you are blind to spiritual realities, and that's what we are naturally, you are blind both to your own evil and you're also blind to God. But when... Praise God, the Lord Jesus Christ translates you from darkness to life. You are astonished. Oh, I think I know some of you who were converted later in life. And you suddenly see with clarity what you have never seen before. And you see the heinousness of your sin. And you see a glorious Redeemer in the face of a holy God who would damn you to hell. And you flee to Jesus Christ and you wake up for the first time. And like that blind man who Christ opened the eyes of, you proclaim with joy. One thing I know, that whereas I was once blind, now I see. And what a glorious thing it is to have the eyes of your understanding opened, friends. And to see Christ. Even as a believer... I pray Lord, that the Lord Jesus Christ would continue to open your eyes. For there are many scales that still remain over our eyes that blind us to seeing our own sin and blind us to the glory of Christ. And day by day, bit by bit, week by week, I pray for you, congregation, that he would continue to open the eyes of your understanding. And mine too. Especially that you would see more clearly Jesus each day. That's one of the reasons we'll be in the book of Hebrews tonight. For that central exhortation, that with your eyes opened, you would lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking where? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of the faith, or our faith. Friends, the only way you can look unto Jesus is if he continues to open the eyes of your understanding. And that's the only way you will lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets you, that you may run with patience. It's by having your eyes restored. And praise God, Jesus has come to do it. Fifth, Jesus said in Isaiah 61 that he would come to set at liberty them that are bruised. And this is actually a very poignant point, friends. Because to be in bondage to the three great enemies of your soul, the world, uh, your flesh, and the devil, is to be bruised by them. And actually, the sense in the Greek language is to be abused by them. If you've ever seen true, true domestic abuse, it's an ugly horrifying thing to see the abused battered eyes swollen shut bruises all over their body but the most devastating thing about it is that there is this thing called Stockholm Syndrome and that is where the abused bond with their abuser and will not leave them and our problem friends is by nature we all suffer from spiritual Stockholm Syndrome. We are bruised by our sin. We could, if we were objective, see the effects of it, both on our soul and in our relationships and our relationship to God. 
We are battered by the world. It doesn't love us. It doesn't care for us. It doesn't remember us when we are gone. It owes nothing to us. We are bound by Satan, who has nothing better in his heart than to laugh when one made in the image of God falls. And we run back to these three great enemies of our soul. And that is spiritual Stockholm Syndrome, as they beat us and beat us and beat us. Yet how tender Jesus is to those abused by sin, the world, and the devil. In Isaiah 42, the very same scroll he read from is another prophecy that you well know that says Jesus, of Jesus, that a bruised reed he shall not break. Our Lord Jesus is tender to those of you who are battered and bruised. When you feel the effects and the wounds of sin upon the soul. So he has come to free you from the bruising captivity that you're in. So turn to him and do not return to your sin as a dog returns to its vomit. That would be like the people in the Exodus. Did they not have spiritual Stockholm Syndrome? And they said, send us back to Egypt. To be abused again. You have to be wise to the deceitfulness of sin, friends. Turn to the Lord who says he will not break a bruised reed and that he will bind and heal you. Even today as a believer, believer, if some sin has beset you, he says he has come to set you at liberty. Ask yourself the question the apostle did as you consider your own sinfulness. Ask, O wretched man that I am, what was the question? Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Answer, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The same message preached in Romans 7, as in Isaiah 61, as in Luke 4, all throughout the word of God, in fact. So these five characteristics define those the Lord has come from, come for, rather. And those are characteristics of abject misery and utter captivity. It is a condition that is incurable by ourselves. It is a captivity that is total and complete. But thankfully, our Lord Jesus says it is not a captivity that is final. Not if the Spirit of the Lord has sent Jesus to free you. You need to go to Christ in humility, friend, right now. Go by faith because he promises to free you and deliver you from misery. You know, our society's values are these. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Get her done. Sad to say, friends, so many have imported that philosophy into the word of God. But it is not found there. Search the scripture. That is the philosophy of devils when it comes to religion. Instead, we hear these wonderful words in Psalm 40 that he has lifted me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. The truly and utter tragic nature of the corruption of the gospel in too many churches is to do what Paul calls is a frustration of the grace of God a setting of it aside. But he wrote, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. That corruption then causes them to cease preaching that all must cast themselves on Jesus to be freed of these five great maladies. It happens, even in our circles, friends. There is a lot of Christless preaching in pulpits in this nation. Even in Reformed churches, maybe even in Reformed Presbyterian churches, a lot of screaming, be better, do better, more law. Yes, the law is good, friends, but it will do you no good without Jesus. Look to Jesus for his power and grace by his Spirit's help. And so praise God, I'll try to cover this much more briefly, that our final heading proclaims, Jesus was sent to deliver the miserable. The final component of Christ's reading in Isaiah 61 was this, that the servant of the Lord would preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Some of you know that that is an allusion to the year of Jubilee. 
Leviticus 25. Uh, boys and girls, you may not know this, uh, maybe you do, that uh, every 50 years, the Jubilee trumpet was supposed to sound out on the Day of Atonement. And on it, the captives were set free and debtors had their debts erased. It was a great celebration because these debts were impossible for most of these people to work off themselves. Many of these men would have been debtors until their dying day if it were not for the Day of Jubilee. And what a glorious sound then the Jubilee trumpet was for debtors to suddenly release in an instant all my debt is wiped clean away instantly. I am free, free at last, the grace of God ringing out in my ears through that trumpet blast. Could you imagine what a glorious thing it would be to hear the sound of the trumpet on the day of Jubilee? And it's no accident, friends, that God tied the year of Jubilee to the day of atonement. The Jubilee pointed to a greater release, the release of our spiritual debt. Jubilee anticipated the Lamb from God who would pay the debt to God to free us. Fittingly, the word Jubilee itself means this, the horn of the ram, the ram's horn, the ram that Jehovah Jireh would provide, friends. And so, having read Isaiah 61 The Son of God did what Christian ministers do today. I'll come back to Jubilee in a moment. He preached the word of God with the reading of it now ended, the acceptable day, year of the Lord. He preached the word of God. And I want you to see how greatly he values the preaching of the word. He was not content to merely read it, but he also must preach it. And do you know, friends, that the preaching of the word is often called in our circles the gospel trumpet? The gospel trumpet. Why? Because it is like blowing the ram's horn of jubilee. The gospel trumpet is that proclaims freedom in Christ. And it is meant to be a sweet, sweet sound in our ears. And that's what Jesus Christ did when he preached the word that day. John Knox famously said, I love to blow my master's trumpet for that reason. Because the proper preaching of the gospel proclaims liberty, friends. And so Jesus, having read the word, preached the word and blew the true jubilee trumpet. And what a sermon it was. A sermon that no mere man would dare to preach. He preached, and we believe this is just the beginning of the sermon. The rest of it not being recorded. He preached, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. What an incredible sermon. In other words, he says, I am the servant of the scroll. I am the sent by the Spirit to liberate you. I am this word made flesh. Because Jesus, praise God, did not just come to preach, but also to perform. Note the verbs in Isaiah 61. He came to preach, heal, recover, and liberate. That distinguishes the one true religion from all the false religions, friends. The Christian faith centers on the works of Jesus Christ and not on the works of its adherents. In the very same scroll of Isaiah, what do you read of the servant of the Lord? That he hath surely, rather, let me step back in Isaiah 53, surely he hath borne our griefs, And carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and blessedly, sorrowfully, we hear, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. To fulfill the gracious words of Isaiah 61, Jesus had to fulfill Isaiah 53. And he did that on the cross, beloved, smitten of God and afflicted, wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities. To be bruised by God in our place 
to be healed by his stripes. Why? Because we go astray. To heal our sorrows and griefs in Isaiah 61, he would have to bear them and carry them in Isaiah 53. Marvel, friends, at the grace of God. Be astonished by Jesus Christ and be grateful for him. How wonderful to say, friends, with the word of God, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. There's no blessed, more blessed word I can give you today. So this morning, you must believe that the Spirit of the Lord came to this place at this time to apply this text to you, beloved. That's why he came, to heal, to recover, and set at liberty. You know, one of the great blessings of being in public worship is that you did not come to hear this silly man here pontificate, to give you my opinion, or to entertain you. You came to hear the gracious words and works of Christ and receive them by faith. And so I ask you, why would you miss out on this for anything in the world, friends? To hear a gracious word and be ministered by Christ. If you would miss out on this for anything else, I would have to say the eyes of your understanding are closed and shut right now. And may God open them truly. Come to public worship, whether here or any other place that preaches the gospel, to receive the healing, recovery, and liberation of the Lord. Come to public worship on the Sabbath and receive great blessings. If sin besets you, come to public worship, but don't just show up. Come begging beforehand that the Lord would set you free. If you mourn, come beforehand, praying that you would receive Jesus and be filled with the joy of the Lord. Come to hear the gracious words that pour out of his mouth week by week. Psalm 45, verse 2. Of Jesus, thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. When Christ is preached, friends, we hear grace. Yes, Christ must be preached. And I don't mean preaching where Christ is slapped on at the end but preaching where Christ is the marrow and substance of the preaching. Because what did the apostles say? But we preach Christ crucified, setting himself in opposition to those who do not. By God's help, friends, chastise me if I do not do it from the pulpit. Because Christless preaching is death and bondage and not liberty, and it robs the word of God of its power. In his preaching of Isaiah 61, what did the Lord do? He preached himself. Christ, our blessed and anointed liberator. The last thing to consider is that Jesus, you may have noticed this if you know Isaiah 61 verse 2, he stopped abruptly in his reading on Isaiah 61 verse 2. He only read the first half Of the second verse, and he did so with purpose. I want you to hear it in its entirety. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He read that far. Here's the rest. And the day of vengeance of our God. He wanted to speak on that day of his first coming. But oh, I believe the people knew what he omitted. We'll pick it up next time. In his first coming, he came to bring peace and show you God is long suffering that he is good to forestall his second coming for a time so that men everywhere may repent. But on his second coming, this same Jesus will come to proclaim the vengeance of God. The vengeance of God due to our sin, our refusal to give it up, and refusal to be freed by the Son of God. And on that day, those not in Christ will be damned forever. Flee. To Jesus now, friends. Only he can liberate you of the debt you owe to God, and God will collect on that debt. Make no mistake. Either Jesus has paid for your debt, or you will have to. And if you pay, you will pay eternally. It's a horrible thought when all you must do is call out to the Lord to be saved. Well, today, I hope and I pray that the gospel has been preached to you that the master's trumpet has sounded, that it, like Jubilee, has proclaimed liberty, because where the Spirit of the Lord is, 
There is liberty, friends, liberty in Christ. And so respond to this trumpet by turning or returning if you are backslidden to the Lord Jesus by faith. Do it without delay or hesitation. Do it now, he said, I have heard thee in a time accepted. And in the day of salvation have I succored thee or helped thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The promise of God is whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise God, friends, for that. And praise God for the certainty of this word. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. That was the promise of Jubilee that your ears have now heard explained. May you accept the truth of it by faith and praise God that you have been set free forever. Amen. Please rise for prayer if you're able.